the goal of the forum is to create a space for staff, trainees, and faculty to discuss difficult topics, share information, learn together, and importantly, to brainstorm actions we can take both individually and collectively to fight racism and injustice. The program is a mixture of sharing information, discussion, and action plans. Uh, we began this several months ago, and the forums are still virtual, but hopefully we'll be in person in the future. We hold them the fourth Tuesday of every month from 12 to 1. And again, we seek not to just share information, but we also hope that the sessions are a little edgy to move people out of their comfort zones a bit and to make them more amenable to change. And we are thrilled you're here with us this month. And I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Susan Wolford, um, the co-chair of the program to uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you so much, Dr. Freed. So it's my um, pleasure today to be able to introduce Dr. Lynn Smitherman. Uh, Dr. Smitherman is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Wayne State University, where she is the vice chair of medical education and the vice chair of diversity, equity and inclusion for the department. Dr. Smitherman received her undergraduate degree from McGill University in Montreal and her medical degree from the University of Cincinnati. She completed a combined MedPeds residency at Wayne State and was a chief resident in pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Michigan. Dr. Smitherman has served in many leadership roles at the National Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics, where in keeping with her research interests, she has contributed to efforts addressing bias, discrimination, and minority representation in clinical research, topics on which she's published widely. Today, she will speak to us about racial literacy and the path to anti-racism. Welcome, Dr. Smitherman. The time is yours. Thank you very much, both Dr. Reed and Dr. Wolford, for inviting me to address um, your department on something that's very near and dear to my heart. So I'm going to get started here. OK. Awesome. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about racial literacy and the path to anti-racism. And, um, and with that, you know, I've spoken to various groups about racism, bias, discrimination, and the effect on our patients, on ourselves, on our workforce, and that type of thing. But hopefully today I can give you a little bit more information in terms of moving forward. Oops. Okay, um, and as James Baldwin says, nothing, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. And so some of the things we're gonna talk about today and hopefully in the future as the conversation continues is that we're gonna get uncomfortable and we're gonna hear some things and we're going to reflect on some things that are gonna take us out of our comfort zone. But getting out of the comfort zone, I think is important for us to move forward. Um, so we're going to talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information, provide some definitions and some examples, and hopefully give some recommendations so that we as individuals can kind of move on through our own personal journeys and taking the information that we have, hopefully collectively as a group, we can move step forward towards anti-racism and dismantling systemic racism. So a little bit of background. So racial literacy was actually conceptualized by um, Franz Windance Twine, um, who's out of Great Britain. And um, basically, in order to communicate effectively, we have to have like a common understanding of racial vocabulary concepts and language. And as one of my colleagues would say, like a shared mental model. In order to make sure that we communicate, we all have to be on the same page. Um, and so racial literacy is basically a set of practices that are designed to teach children and adults how to a little bit about the history of race and racism, to identify uh, forms of racism, and to develop strategies for countering and coping with racism. And then anti-racism is a process of actively identifying and opposing racism. And the goal of anti-racism is to challenge racism and actively change policies, behaviors, and beliefs that perpetuate racist ideas and action. Anti-racism is rooted in action. I always say anti-racism is a verb. 
And it's about taking steps to eliminate racism at the individual, institutional, and structural levels. And this is not a new concept, but the Black Lives Matter movement has helped increase the focus on the importance of anti-racism. So why is this important? And it's important on so many different levels. First of all, racial identi uh, identity occurs at a young age. And I'll give you some examples in terms of how young children are already, you know, based on their environment, um, their communities, their family members, they start receiving messages about race, class, and physical appearance, um, and they're embedded in their psyches from those around them. And these messages can be positive or negative. I mean, think about the first time when you thought about yourself as an individual, how you felt, how you thought you were within a group and when you thought about others and people that were outside of the group. And unfortunately, it's happening at younger and younger ages. Negative messaging damages self-esteem and contributes to internalized racism. And racial literacy promotes the acceptance of all forms of diversity. Um, and racial literacy is needed to progress towards being anti-racist. And the other reason why this is important is what's going on today. And what's going on today didn't happen, didn't start today. It didn't start last year with the murder of George Floyd. This is 400 years of structural racism that's been in this country that is perpetuated. And, you know, dismantling this is not going to happen overnight. But I think it's important that we recognize the genesis of all of this is what's happening right now. And that's going to help us to move forward. So I'm going to start with an illustration, and um, I love analogies. It drives my husband crazy, but let's just think about this. Just, just work with me. Just, just humor me. So let's talk about hemodynamic shock, okay? And so let's say that you know you have a patient come in, and they present with shock, hypovolemic shock. All right, they're coming in, blood pressure is low, heart rate starts off kind of cardiac, and then they're kind of you know dribbling down a little bit. So when you think about the first step in treating hypodynamic shock, the first thing you need to do is start fluids, IV fluids. You need volume to support circulation, all right? And so what I like to think about of volume is basically fundamental knowledge, all right? So just kind of think about that for a second, fundamental knowledge. And then racial literacy is acquiring fundamental knowledge of racism in the context of the society. So basically, racial literacy is your IV fluids, it's your volume, all right? Now, the next step of additional support, because sometimes, you know, there are times that you're going to need additional support because volume might not be everything that you need at shop. So the next thing you think about is pressors, okay? And so, and we all know that pressors are only effective if you have adequate volume, okay? Pressors don't work by themselves, you need the volume to do that. So think of anti-racism as an action now that's possible with the underlying fundamental knowledge, okay? So your patient comes in, you give them fluids, it helps a little bit, but not so much. You start the pressures. Oh, we're doing better now. We're fine. And then recovery. So your patient recovers. They're fine. They're hemodynamically stable. And eventually they get discharged and they go home. And you know that they're going to be okay, especially if they continue with oral hydration, with their normal meals and, you know, what they're drinking normally and that type of thing. And their internal physiology is going to be able to promote and support their pressure and their other hemodynamic things that are going on in their bodies. Okay. So think about, you know, acquiring knowledge doesn't stop after you recover from the shock, but it's something that is ongoing. And once you continue feeding yourself and providing yourself with more knowledge as you go along, your body kind of goes along with it. And it just becomes, you know, just part of you. You don't have to think about it anymore. After a while, you don't think about, I have to drink so much water in a day. You do it, your body responds to it, and you move on. All right, so let's move on into some definitions. Let's start with bias, all right? And as we all know, bias is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person, or group compared with another, and usually in a way considered unfair. And we have two types of biases. We have explicit bias, which is openly expressed, we're aware of the bias, and it operates consciously. And then we have implicit bias. And implicit bias is expressed indirectly. We're usually unaware of that bias, and it can operate or usually operates unconsciously. And sometimes there's an overlap. So the example that I like to use is that I have an explicit bias against the color green. 
I just, out of all the colors in the rainbow, that's probably my least favorite color. My husband knows not to buy me any green clothing. It's just, it's just my thing. I don't mind vegetables. I eat solid. I like broccoli, that type of thing. But the color green is just not my favorite. So that's an explicit bias. However, I have to be aware of it because if two people are coming in and they're interviewing for the same position and one's wearing a green outfit and one's wearing the blue outfit, am I going to judge the person green harsher or in a different way than the person that's wearing blue? Is my bias going to come out into a discriminatory action against the person that's being green so or wearing green? So I have to think about my biases and recognize them and own them and recognize what they are and just make sure that they don't impact some of the choices and some of the decisions and some of the actions that I'm going to make. There is the implicit association test out of Harvard University that I um, invite everybody, if you haven't already, um, to go ahead and take part in. Some people kind of question the validity, but I think it's kind of eye-opening, especially when you think that you don't have biases or you don't have biases against certain things to find out that you do. And it's not just racial bias that it looks at. It looks at um, abilities versus disabilities. It looks at weight. It looks at gender. It looks at all kinds of different things. And you'd be surprised as it uncovers some of the things that you didn't realize you had biases. And then once you're aware of that, you now have some information. You got a little volume now to kind of work on to prevent that from um, making decisions that you might make um, unfairly. Okay, and then moving on to race. Now race is a social construct and um, it's interesting. So the first time it was really documented in this country was in 1676 with Bacon's uh, rebellion. So Nathaniel Bacon was a wealthy landowner in Virginia um, and he and the other landowners, uh, wealthy landowners at that time had sharecroppers um, from various places, from European countries, from African countries, from all over the place, working their land. And of course, wealthy landowners at that time thought that they needed more wealth, which meant more land. Um, and, you know, they didn't own all the land, um, but certain Native American communities did. So they decided to go out and just take land from the Native Americans that were there for centuries. Um, they thought it was their right to do that, so they went ahead and did that against the governor's, um, who happened to be Nathaniel Bacon's cousin, but anyway, against the uh, governor's uh, wishes. So they went ahead to do that. The interesting thing that happened, though, after all of that was over, was that uh, Nathaniel Bacon and the other landowners noticed with, because they had their sharecroppers for militia to help raid these Native American settlements and take over that land. And they noticed that that united front was that powerful. They also recognized that there were more sharecroppers than there were landowners. And you're like, uh oh, this is this might be a problem here. If they decide to turn against us, we'll be in a lot of trouble. So what they decided to do was to grant citizenship to those from European countries and give them more privileges than those from African countries. So that was where here some of those um, uh, divisions regarding race started. Um, and then eventually it became based on some phenotypic features of groups of people, whether it's skin color, hair texture, bone, uh, facial bones, you know, that type of thing, height. Um, but what it did over time, because again, you know, over time, some um, scientists and biologists also jumped onto that bandwagon and decided to also um, start classifying people in terms of race and um, giving them um, attributes, um, many of which were false um, to some races versus others. But this also over time allowed and justified the extermination of Native Americans, the enslavement of Africans, the exclusion of Asian immigrants in the US and on and on and on. As we know though, with time, race has become more ambiguous socially because as people started um, intermingling, intermarrying, you know, um, it's very difficult now to kind of trace your lineage to a specific group, um, especially if you know you were your ancestors were part of the transatlantic slave trade. It's very difficult for us to kind of figure out exactly where we're from. Um, and also the Human Genome Project also kind of dispelled a lot of myths regarding race because we share so much more in our DNA. There's more that's uh, commonly shared than that's different. So that's race. 
Ethnicity is something different though. Ethnicity is a self-defined concept, which is based on group identity, whether it's culture, language, kinship, or history. And it doesn't rely on hierarchy and it's separate from race. So the example I'll use here is um, what we use in terms of ethnicity in this country is Hispanic or Latino. Now Hispanic um, uh, heritage um, basically refers to heritage that originates from Spanish speaking countries, such as Spain, Mexico, and Peru. Whereas Latino heritage though, um, um, originates from the countries in Central and South America and the Caribbean, such as Brazil. So as you can see, Brazil might be, people from Brazil might be considered Latino, but not Hispanic because their major language is Portuguese, not Spanish. Um, and then you throw race on top of that, you know, um, race really has nothing to do with eth uh, um, ethnicities, but you have um, people heritage might be Hispanic or Latino um, that have race that identify with either white race or black race or other races in, in indigenous races, depending on where they're coming from. So there is a separation between ethnicity and race. Okay, so all that to say that racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on physical features described as race. And it unfairly advantages some and disadvantages others. The components of racism though are two. There's racial prejudice, which is already the preconceived notion that some races are superior compared to others and social power and that they can uphold those prejudicial ideas and put them into policy and laws. And we have um, actually four basic types of racism. We have institutional racism, structural racism, interpersonal racism and internalized racism. So I have this nice little clip that I'd like to share. So give me just a minute to switch screens. So hold on. A gardener's tale, an allegory for Racism, an adaptation for Camara Phyllis Jones allegory by Alex, Brittany, Courtney, Helen, and Lindsay, illustrated by Brittany. Once upon a time ago, there was a gardener. She and her husband had recently bought a brand new house with two large flower boxes on the porch. The box on the left was empty, while the box on the right was full of old rocky soil. The gardener decided to go buy some new potting soil for the empty box, but left the box on the right full of the poor rocky soil that it had already had. While at the store, the gardener also bought two packets of seeds. They were both the same type of flower, but one packet would bear pink blossoms while the other would bloom red. The gardener loved the red flowers and has always preferred them to the pink. She planted the red seeds in the flower box with the new rich soil and the pink seeds in the poor rocky soil. Soon enough, the red flowers began to sprout, grow up, and flourish. The fittest of the red flowers in the rich soil grew full, vigorous, and strong. Even the weakest made it to a middling height. But the box with the poor rocky soil looked much different. The weak among the pink seeds didn't make it, and the strongest among them grew only to a middling height. In time, the flowers in the boxes went to seed and dropped their progeny into the same soil in which they had been growing. Next year, the same things happened. The flowers in the world grew all vigorous and strong. The pink flowers yet again struggled to survive. These flowers went to seed, and year after year, the cycle repeated itself. One day, a giant gust of wind blew a pink seed from the pink box into the red box. The gardener saw this and immediately ran to the porch and stopped the seed from entering the red box. Another year passed and the pattern of strong, beautiful red flowers as compared to weak and scrawny pink flowers became more and more entrenched. That spring, a bee came along to pollinate the pink flowers. The pink flowers panicked and shouted, stop, don't bring me any of the pink pollen. I prefer the pollen of the red. 10 years later, the gardener came back to survey the garden. When she looked at the two boxes, she remarked, I was right to prefer the red to pink how vibrant and beautiful the red flowers are and how pitiful and scrawny the pink ones are. Okay.
Okay, so um, going back to levels of racism with systemic racism, this is basically racial bias across institutions and society. The example would be the racial wealth gap that reflects the cumulative effects of racial inequities. And in the allegory, it would be the different soil in the, in the two different flower boxes, the rocky soil versus the new fresh soil. Institutional racism is basically racial inequities within institutions and systems of power, such as school systems that provide unequal opportunities for people of different races, redlining, and the Burwood Wall. So the Burwood Wall is actually in Detroit, Michigan. It is a concrete wall about um, six, seven feet high that was built in 1940. And it divided two neighborhoods um, on the west side of the wall. It, um, um, there were white, um, uh, families and on the east side of the wall there were black families um, and so when the um, federal housing um, um, organization started and started giving home loans um, they give those to the um, west side the white families on the um, on the west side of the um, Burwood wall and not to the families on the east side of the Burwood wall and it still stands today actually there's lots of different murals and people have um, painted it but it still stands today again as a visual reminder of the red had gone on. But in the allegory on um, the, um, the gardener keeping the seeds in separate boxes and refusing the pink seed to get into the red box is um, basically a illustration of institutional racism. And interpersonal racism is basically how we act upon our racial beliefs when we interact with others. An example of that would be the brown eye blue eyes experiment that um, Jane Elliott did back in the 1960s. She was a third grade teacher and um, after Martin Luther King was assassinated, um, she was very upset. She lived in a rural community in Iowa, which was all white. Um, and so in order to um, teach her children um, the effects of racism and discrimination, she divided the class into two with um, those with blue eyes and those with brown eyes. On the first day, the children with blue eyes had all kinds of privileges. They got seconds for lunch, they can use the water fountain, they got extra recess time, and those with brown eyes had flu fewer privileges. And in fact, she actually put collars on the children with brown eyes so that you can tell which color, what color their eyes were from a distance. And over the course of that day, um, brown eyed children that were straight A's started doing poorly academically, best friends started fighting, and there was a new derogatory term called brown eyes that they, the blue eyed children would call the brown eyed children. The next day she flipped the switch and so that the children with blue eyes did not get the privileges and those with the brown eyes did. And the same type of thing happened. Those that were inferior did poorly academically, um, friends were fighting with each other and then derogatory names would go back and forth. And on the, the end of the second day, she kind of brought them all together and had a nice little debriefing, which was good because I doubt she had IRB approval for this little experiment. I think the parents were pretty really upset about it as well, but it taught what was very interesting though, is that we had an adult that the children respected and loved and trusted, give them very specific messages and they turned on each other. And it just shows how vulnerable children can be and how readily they adopted these messages and started you know, discriminating against each other very actively. And that's really kind of scary. And then um, we have internalized racism, which is the private racial beliefs that are held by individuals that can be conscious or unconscious and held towards oneself or towards others. An example of this is the black doll, white doll experiment that Kenneth and Mamie Jones did back in the 1940s, where they gave children two different dolls that were identical except for the skin color. There was a white doll and a black doll. And the children uniformly um, gave all the positive attributes to the white doll and all the negative attributes to the black doll. This experiment had been repeated over and over and over again, and most recently back in 2015, and it still carries, um, especially when it comes to black and brown children. They will give the negative attributes to the black doll and the positive attributes to the white doll. And I have some clips at the end um, that um, you can use for reference later on when the black doll I, when a little black girl gives all the negative attributes to the black doll, and then she's asked, what doll looks more like you? You know, the expression on her face was just one that just wants to tear your heart up. I mean, just really breaks your heart. And so it shows that racism is taught. Children are not born with this, but they're taught it. And as we all know, the anti-Asian racism that's been going on over the last year, um, and even before then, but more, in, in the public eye right now because of the coronavirus. 
So when we talk about racial literacy, we have several components. We have to, first of all, recognize that race is a social construct. It is not a biologic reality. And we have to view racism as a contemporary problem, rather his, a historical legacy. I mean, it's not gone. It didn't just show up again a year ago. It has always been here. But unfortunately, because of the structural and institutional racism that this country has embraced, it's become the status quo and people don't always recognize it when they see it, when it's right in front of them. Um, we have to understand the ways that experiences of racism and racialization are mediated by class, gender, inequality and sexuality. As we know, um, African-American um, men are basically, you know, more prone um, to more obvious and explicit racist acts, um, especially when you're looking at the news on a daily basis, you know, in terms of being pulled over by police, um, in terms of prison sentences, in terms of educational changes. I mean, it's just out there. Uh, we have to recognize the cultural and symbolic value of whiteness. We have to understand that racial identities are learned and an outcome of social practices. We have to possess um, a racial grammar and vocabulary so that we can discuss race, racism, and anti-racism. Again, a shared mental model. And we have to develop the ability to interpret racial uh, codes and racialized practices. And as Angela Davis says, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We actually have to be anti-racist. So what does it mean to be anti-racist? I mean, people are talking about this, what's going on? Because a lot of people, just about everybody say, oh, I'm non-racist. But there's a big difference between being non-racist and anti-racist. So non-racist says that you're uncomfortable in your skin, be comfortable in your skin. Anti-racism teaches being uncomfortable is how you learn. Non-racist teaches everyone is equal, I see no color and anti-racism teaches to value each other's differences. Non-racist teaches do as I say, and anti-racism teaches do as I do. Non-racist teaches I wanna give my child a diverse culture in school, and anti-racist teaches to advocate for all children in the school. Non-racist teaches to read from authors that we know and trust, and anti-racism teaches to diversify your media diet to include more voices. And a non-racist teaches to teach them as much as you know about racism and anti-racism teaches to learn more and keep learning more, increasing your volume. Non-racist teaches to come with good intentions and anti-racism teaches to know your impact. There's a huge difference between um, intentions and impact. And um, one of the things I think is important that when we uh, confront somebody or interact with somebody and we read the body language, it's important to ask about the impact of that exchange so that you can learn and grow from it. Non-racist teaches that um, acknowledges that racism is wrong and anti-racism teaches to intervene when racist acts occur. Remember that, that non-racist is an adjective, but being anti-racist is a verb. So what are some of the steps towards becoming anti-racist? First is to learn about implicit bias in a historical and social economic political context is to highlight and interrogate uh, current policies and practices that create and reproduce inequitable outcomes that reinforce our implicit biases. For example, you know, looking at you know, your institution, you know, is the diversity where it should be? And if not, why not? And why isn't it? And what are things we can do to counteract that? Um, is to understand that structural racism, othering and exclusion have become normalized. It's the status quo. We've almost been desensitized to some of the things that have gone on in this country because we see it over and over again and then it's not that big of a deal anymore and it's just acceptance and that's where we need to change. We can't confuse the fact that we all have implicit biases with immunity from responsibility. Yes, we all have biases. Yes, we need to recognize that, but we also need to do what it takes to kind of change, confront our biases and move forward. We need to recognize that working for social justice is not about helping them or helping others, but it's about dismantling the status quo. And any effort to interrupt implicit bias and its impact must be accompanied by efforts to dismantle structures that exclude and build structures that provide access to opportunity or create new opportunities. 
So one of the things that I really love about this picture is that, you know, it, it, it kind of shows, if you think about in this first panel here and all across, this fence is basically structural racism. It could be redlining. It could be discrimination with the GI Bill. It could be so many different, it could be voting rights, okay? But this is it. And the reality is that we have some that have more privileges than others. And we have some poor individuals like this poor little guy over here in the purple shirt, he's under the ground. I mean, he's just got absolutely nothing. And the expectation is you're supposed to pull yourself up from your boot, uh, from your bootstraps, no matter what um, barriers you might have and move forward. But that can be impossible in certain, in certain circumstances. When you talk about equality, everybody gets the same number of resources, but again, not everybody benefits from those resources because you have differences in terms of need. When you talk about equity though, the resources are distributed so that those that need more get more and those who are okay don't get anything extra and that's okay. But the bottom line is though, when you really think about it, why is there a barrier to begin with? Okay, so it really, if we're really gonna make any progress, we really need to take this fence down. We need to really dismantle um, structural racism and move forward so that we don't have to think about, you know, this group over there or that group or those others not getting the chances and the opportunities that they deserve. And there's positive impacts to anti-racism as well, such as the ability to reduce obstacles to employment and in improves the educational experience. There have been several studies um, looking at trainees, um, even pediatric trainees in specific, um, in terms of some of the microaggressions that they've had to encounter um, in the workplace. And if you talk to people, especially particular, <laughs> particularly individuals in my generation and that have come before me, uh, some of the things that we've had to deal with in that educational environment is just absolutely outrageous. But now that people are recognizing more, at least the students in this particular generation, most of the time do have an office or a voice or an individual that they can go to to talk about what's going on. And that can in itself improve the overall educational experience of these individuals. Um, Anti-racism reduces racial disparities in the criminal justice system and improves um, interventions for youth who are at risk and increases access to community resources and encourages social and political pop, uh, participation from all sides, because those who are disenfranchised are gonna be less likely to wanna step up and move out and, and participate in um, what's going on in society um, than those uh, who don't. So I think it's important for everybody to recognize that everybody's got value. And once individuals feel valued in terms of who they are and they don't have to change, they're more apt to participate in society. So where do you start with this anti-racism journey? Well, the first, as I mentioned before, is to challenge your biases and or your prejudices. You know, kind of look into yourself, look into, you know, some of the things, your past, your experiences with others, do the implicit association test. I mean, and, and none of us are immune. I go back and think about some of the interactions I've had with people and go, ooh, I can't believe I said that or I can't believe I did that. So we are all guilty of it, but the thing is not to dwell on that, but to make an effort to move forward. Step two is to educate yourself about how racism is systemic. Again, building up that volume, you know, trying to get more and more education and to keep educating yourself as you go on. Um, as one of my former program directors said, you have to arm yourself with knowledge and then that way you can move forward. And step three is to take action, okay? So this is the anti-racism piece, the verb, the action. Individually speak up when uh, you witness racist events or actions. If you um, hear somebody talking um, about a patient in a discriminatory manner, or if you're in the store and you see somebody that's being judged unfairly, that's the time to speak up. You know, you don't need to have an audience around you. You don't have to have video cameras or phones, you know, taping what's going on. It can be quiet if you notice somebody who's being um, uh, treated unfairly, it's okay just to, you know, catch their eye, you know, acknowledge that you understand and then stand up for them. And even though it sounds simple, it's very, very difficult to do, especially those of us that are not used to standing out there, or as one person would say, being that first domino. You know, it's interesting though, after, you know, you step in, others usually tend to follow, but that first step is so, so difficult to do, and it takes time to feel comfortable with it.
And then structurally, again, we have to create new policies to help level the playing field and making sure that everybody's got access to all of the resources that they need to succeed and to do well. And then finally, it's important to recognize that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Just from day one, just recognizing that you have to make a change and you have to learn more to do more, that's important in itself. And it's not going to happen overnight. You know, the situation that we're in right now didn't happen overnight. You know, things started several centuries ago. And it's going to take hopefully not that long to dismantle structural racism in this country. But hopefully, as we move forward and we have the momentum working with us, us, we can make some positive changes. The beauty of anti-racism is that you don't have to be free of, to pretend to be free of racism to be anti-racist. And that's very true. A lot of people are going, well, I don't know, you know, I'm not there yet. And that's okay, because anti-racism is the commitment to fight racism wherever you find it and including in yourself. And that's the only way forward. And again, change is hard, change is difficult. So hopefully, you know, you, you know, we kind of start off here like, uh oh, I got to make a change um, because you say something or there's a situation that happens and all of a sudden you become aware that something's not right. I have to make a change within myself in order to do better. So you start off like completely unaware. So you have unconscious incompetence. And then the next step is conscious incompetence. OK, I know I need to make a change, but I don't know what I'm doing yet. So that's when you start learning and changing. You start, you know, thinking about things that you've done, you try to learn a little bit more, you do well with some situations, you don't do well with some other situations, you learn and you move on. And then you develop conscious competence, which means you're thinking about it now. Okay, I know in this situation, I have to do this. I know in that situation, I have to do that. Because the goal is to come become unconsciously competent Whereas your actions now, you're, you're mastering this um, and all of a sudden now this comes second nature. You don't have to think about it. So when we as ourselves as individuals think about racial literacy and what we need to do with on ourselves, whether it's um, ourselves, our departments, our institutions, recognize that families are already thinking about this and families are already having discussions around the kitchen table. So I'd like to play a couple of clips for you that I think are very telling in terms of some of the stories that people are sharing. So let me go. Let me do it this way. These are my sweet, adorable boys, but they are also my little rambunctious rascals. That's what I always call them. Dear child. Dear child. Dear child. I know you're hearing a lot of things that are confusing and scary right now. You're growing up at a time when hate when bigotry, when prejudice, it has been legitimized. So yeah, there are going to be times when you are going to be called a terrorist. They want to get rid of the Muslims in this country, or we would be better off without them. Or that our religion means hate, or it means killing, or people asking you to explain things about your birthplace, or questioning whether you're an American. You know, I know that you've heard about all of these incidents, kids, who look like you, being bullied. And I'm sure you're afraid. All those people don't know who we are, and that's what makes it so easy for them to hate and for them to fear. People are just misinformed, and they exist. That's just a, a reality. And I was always afraid to share my identity, but I don't want you to be afraid of that. I want you to really look into yourself and see the light that's in you. This is, this is an opportunity for us to become louder and stronger, help people understand who you are. A Muslim 
who shares the same dreams, the same aspirations, the same hopes like anyone else. You are worthy and you're loved. You are beautiful. You are strong. You are capable. You are the most amazing child I've ever met. And I'm so lucky to be your mom. I want you to be proud of who you are. I want you to friend as many uh, people from different religions and race and ethnicities. And I want you to see that beyond our minuscule differences, it is uh, our shared humanity that makes us who we are. Mm. Oh, shit. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules. Ten rules of survival. Ten rules of survival if stopped by the police. Number one, be polite and respectful when stopped by the police. Be polite. Be respectful. Remember that your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. Your goal is to get home safely. I'm sorry. Number two. If you feel your rights have been violated, you and your parents have a right to file a formal complaint with your local police jurisdiction. Number three, do not, under any circumstances, get in an argument with the police. Number four, always remember that anything you say or do can be used against you in court. Number five, keep your hands in plain sight. Make sure the police can see your hands at all times. Number six, avoid physical contact with police officers. Do not make any sudden movements and keep your hands out of your pockets. Number seven, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not, do not run, even if you are afraid. If you are afraid. Number eight, even if you believe you are innocent, do not resist arrest. Number nine, if you are arrested, do not make any statements about the incident until you are able to meet with a lawyer or public defender. Number 10, stay calm and remain in control. Watch your words. Watch your body language. Watch your emotions. Remember. Remember. Remember, your goal is to get home safely. Get home safely. So yes, um, these are conversations and there's more of them. And actually I have several links um, that the at the, um, on my last slide that I will um, send to your organizers so you can view them at your leisure. But these are the conversations that our families are having. And it's unfortunate that we have to talk to our children in this way. I um, sat down with both of my kids and both of them went to um, uh, private schools for high school. And I remember I waited uh, an extra year before I allowed my son to get his driver's license because several of his friends lived in suburban communities and I was scared to death of him traveling um, for assignments, um, for group projects and that type of thing. And my children will tell you that um, I was probably one of the few parents that walked in on every 
party that they went to introduce myself to the um, adults that were supervising the, uh, the party uh, just to make sure you just have when you're uh, an African-American parent, especially the African-American parent of an African-American male child of that fear um, of what's going on. And now it's so interesting, especially um, what happened over the last week or so is that there's a new app now, um, if you get pulled over by the police, um, that um, automatically turns on your cell phone so that they can record your interaction with the police. And not only does it record that interaction, it sends an SOS message to whoever you want to, to let them know what your location is and what's going on. So unfortunately, uh, many of us are still living in fear um, of our children. Um, and I have like nine nieces and nephews, and I made sure that all of them downloaded that app as well. Um, because with what's going on in, in this society, we have to think of a different mindset of what's going on and we're trying our best to protect our children and even our patients at the same time. Um, so um, uh, hopefully you've learned that our systemic racism is a public health crisis, that this is something that's been going on for centuries, that it still needs a lot of work in terms of dismantling, but the work starts with us as individuals. I hope you've learned that arming yourself with knowledge, increasing the volume of knowledge that you have is not something that you stop doing at one time, but hopefully something that you will continue to do, that you will wanna do. And as you get more knowledge, you can put that knowledge into action so that when you see things that are unfair, when you see policies that support discrimination or implicit bias and that type of thing, that you have um, the courage to stand up and say, no, this is wrong and we need to do something to change it. I'd like to thank you for your attention. I do have some references later on um, here, um, references, uh, resources for your personal journey um, in terms of books, in terms of um, different podcasts and other things that might be of interest to you. And then I've also will make sure that um, your organizers get this list of video clips uh, range from a whole different um, aspects, um, talking about um, conversations around the table with Native Americans, uh, with those that are Hispanic and Latino, um, and you know other things I think will be helpful as well. So that said, I will take any questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Smitherman. You certainly increased our knowledge and given us a fantastic call to action and almost brought me to tears with one of, with that, that last video. I, it's so hard to think about that talk um, and what that means for so many people. But we have some questions in the um, chat and please um, do continue to put your questions in the chat for Dr. Smitherman. We have a few minutes to take those. The first one comes from um, Dr. Joyner. He says, is it appropriate for pediatricians to introduce the talk at our visits with patients, especially patients of color? Yes, um, as a matter of fact, um, for especially for my male African-American patients, I've played that clip uh, to them. Um, and I think it's important to let them know. And actually, um, Pediatrics um, published an article, I want to say maybe about two or three years ago, about how to approach, especially your African American and Hispanic uh, male patients with this information. Now, I remember I gave this talk and someone confronted me and asked, well, do you do the same thing for your white patients? And I said, yes, but it's a different context because again, a lot of kids are hanging out together, different ethnic groups, different socials and cultural groups. And I tell them that, you know, if you have an individual in your car that's black or Latino or Hispanic, you know, remember that they might get treated differently than you. So you also need to make sure um, that, you know, you follow these rules of engagement uh, when pulled over, but also recognize that, you know, your friends um, might be treated a little bit differently and you might not be able to do something in the heat of the moment, but afterwards, you know, be an honest witness, you know, let, you know, folks know what's going on so that we can hopefully dismantle this later. Awesome, fantastic, thank you. Um, please continue to put your questions in the chat. We'll um, convey them to Dr. Smitherman. Um, I have one. When lots of what we talked about today, or addressed today, speaks to the individual change that many of us need to consider um, and embark upon that journey. And 
I wondered if you had any more advice for departments, um, institutions, and ways in which uh, that sort of journey can be supported. I, I think that's a great question. And I think that, you know, some of the things um, to consider to do would be to look at everything with um, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So if you're looking at things that your department might need, if there's some policies, for example, or if you're looking to hire, you know, individuals, new staff or new faculty or something like that, you know, kind of look over like, you know, do we have what we need? And if not, are we looking at all of the places? I remember, um, years ago, uh, we were looking um, on an institutional level, you know, why don't we have, you know, many African American faculty members or Hispanic faculty members or Native American faculty members. And, you know, the response we got back was, well, you know, there's not a lot of them in the pool, you know, to recruit from. And we're like, well, where are you looking? You know, are you looking at HBCUs? You know, are you looking at other, you know, um, colleges and universities, you know, with graduate departments, you know, with, you know, a large Latino or Native American or Hispanic uh, population? You know, are you actually outreaching to those uh, organizations? Are you looking at the National Medical Association? Are you looking at the National Hispanic Medical Association? I mean, there's other things that people don't know. And so I think it's important for us to let people know, like, look, these organizations are out there they're ready their individuals are, are you know we just have to look harder and look deeper into what's available that's so important to diversify that search mm -hmm. and sometimes then it brings up the issue of um if one would say the pipeline but two being it being um ready to fill to fill those positions and in your role as um the vice Chair for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, are there any programs that you recommend or ideas for doing pipeline type interventions to help increase? Right, so I think um, most colleges now and um, campuses do start, um, but there's several different organizations. I know on the medical school level, there's a um, Student National Medical Association, SNMA. There's also a Student Hispanic Medical Association. But even if you get down to like the undergraduate level and the high school level, there are some, um, there's science clubs, there's Future Physicians of America, those types of programs as well, that I think is important to kind of reach out and just say, hey, if you're interested, you know, um, now because of the pandemic is kind of difficult, but we used to have people come shadow us in our, um, in our departments and, you know, in our clinics and that type of thing, just to get people that are interested. Um, there was a really cool program in Detroit called DAPSEP, which is the Detroit area. Um, it was an organization to introduce kids to STEM. Um, and then again, you know, they, so they had different people from different backgrounds come and talk to various school children. They're mostly public school children in Detroit just to let them know like, hey, these opportunities are available to you because a lot of times families don't know and kids don't know that they have these opportunities. So just getting that word out there is important um, as well. Awesome, thank you. There is a, um, there's a comment here in the chat. Thank you for the powerful and educational images and YouTube visuals. The competency visuals were helpful. I appreciate the hope and encouragement you inspire in everyone um, that we all can improve our competency in this area. We are in this together. That's wonderful. <laughs> thank you for that comment. And thinking about, again, that individual change, and then as a pediatrician, our interactions with um, patients, the talk obviously mm -hmm. comes um, sort of more when kids are about to venture out without their parents, etc. But do you address race um, in your encounters with patients even earlier on? And if so, in what ways? So that is recommended um, for sure. And it can be a little awkward at first. Um, and so some of the things to kind of think about is, you know, and I ask everybody, what are your, you know, especially when they're babies, you know, what are your dreams and your hopes for your child, you know, as they grow up? What do you, what do you envision them being like as a older child, as an adult, that type of thing? And then the other thing I ask about, you know, what are your fears? You know, um, you know, and especially some of the things that are happening now, because, you know, the, the 10 rules video, I mean, we know individuals that followed those rules and were not successful or did not survive those encounters. So sometimes even doing the best that you can uh, can be uh, difficult. And so, you know, uh, uh, addressing that with them as well. I think you have to do it on an individual basis. I think you have to um, look to see where the family is as well. 
Um, you know, if somebody uh, comes in um, with obvious, um, the way their culture is obviously discriminatory, um, they have lots of biases and that type of thing. Um, it's something that over time, you know, you would want them to get to that point. Again, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And sometimes it takes several, several encounters uh, with an individual whose um, ideas might be very different from your own to kind of at least be able to kind of meet on common ground and just look at what the similarities are and then try to move on from there. Thank you. And we'll take, I think this may be our last question that we can take. Um, the question is, or the statement is, I'm a mixed race, black slash white. I'm mixed race, black slash white. And my son, now 13, is also mixed, but he does not look like a minority. I always fear that he will have or is having identity issues, given that he can easily pass. I grapple with making sure he is comfortable and proud of his background. I do not believe this is promoted when he is not with me. My son and I different, oh, grew up differently, I think. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions? Yeah, that's huge. And one of the things I didn't get to really um, address is that there is within um, the black community, within the Hispanic community, there is so much diversity in that community, um, you know, and just looking at the way we look, uh, one of my earliest um, encounters with being other. So I have a sister um, who is uh, the same parents, um, who is very fair with freckles with green eyes. And I have darker skin and brown skin and brown eyes and darker hair. And I remember when I was five and she was three and we were playing together in front of our house, uh, a woman stopped by and told us that we could not be sisters because my sister was white and I wasn't. And I remember we looked at each other and we went and asked my mother, um, you know, who, you know, kind of sat us down and had to let us know at that age that, you know, we're, you know, just different colors and that's who we are. Um, and, and with that, you know, I do have some family members that, that you know, are very fair, um, that are able to not, that, are, that I might identify as being a minority, but are not looked upon by others and can use that to kind of segue to get along a little bit easier than others. And it is hard. I think the important thing is when we talk about um, racial literacy is to have people feel proud of who they are. Um, and I know sometimes it's difficult to come from two different backgrounds because you want to be able to celebrate both, you know, without being judged. Unfortunately, when we go out into the world, um, you know, people want to classify it. Humans want to classify because it makes them feel comfortable if they can put you in a particular category. And so, you know, to kind of break that trend can be a little bit uncomfortable for us to say, no, I'm not that, or I'm both, or I'm the other. There's a Cherokee um, um, quote that says, um, I don't tell you who you are, you tell me who you are, and that is who you are. And that speaks to letting everybody identify with where they feel comfortable and moving on from there. So it is difficult um, for those that are trying to navigate two different cultures and two different backgrounds without being judged, but it's just gonna take time and experience. And it might not be, early on they see this it might not be till they're older until their parents themselves that they might recognize the importance of acknowledging both and embracing both thank you again that was just phenomenal um there are lots of um uh, statements about how people have enjoyed the presentation in the chat and some shout outs from your previous students um so i'd like to again thank you for presenting to us today and thank you to all those who make this forum possible and to all of you for attending. Um, together, we can make a difference. So um, looking forward to seeing everyone again at the fourth Tuesday in May. And um, I'll make sure to give you those reference slides to you so you can disperse them to those who need them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.